Hello and welcome to the tour report from Secret Golf. Well, this week we're on to the 3M Open. We'll talk about that in a minute, maybe a few minutes, because first of all, we really have to celebrate the fact that Brian Harmon is the champion golfer of the year, Elk. How did we miss it? (laughs) We're both kicking ourselves that we didn't have him as one of our picks because we both talked about him. He's a a long-time Secret Golf contributor, a really good friend of yours, someone you talk to all the time about his game. And it all came together for him in the best way possible. Yeah, and I think, Diane, it was a tremendous win by Brian Harmon. I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I don't think anyone got within four strokes of him from Friday afternoon on, <clears throat> which was amazing. You know, the most amazing thing I think, Diane, was this was the third time at Royal Liverpool that exactly the same model won the tournament. In 2006 with Tiger, uh, hit led the field in fairways hit, only visited a pot bunker once. Rory, mm-hmm. was it 14, 2014? He did exactly the same thing. He led the tour in driving accuracy. And then, of course, this year, Brian Harmon led the tour, led the week in driving accuracy and only visited one bunker. Diane, do you think that the players missed this? Do you think that they, all the big guns went over there and they hit it further up the fairway and got in trouble up on the hills, in the bunkers and so on? Because let's face it, the the real superstar players did not play well uh, at Royal Liverpool Mm -hmm. and Harmon was able to play a very link style further back, hitting the ball up onto the greens and then putting his two key stats was driving accuracy and putting to me. They missed it. What do you say? Well, we, we spoke about that and that was the real talk of this course. And the strategy was going to be that you were going to have to lay back off the tee you were going to have to avoid the bunkers. That was going to be the number one rule <laughs> was to avoid these pot bunkers and and keep the ball in the fairway. And Harmon did that. What Harmon did, you know, and obviously we know him, you know him very, very well. He played his own game. He kept his head down. He has that like gritty determination that he wasn't, you know, involved in anything else. He didn't act like he was feeling a lot of pressure. He just kept his head down, battled and played his game. And even on Saturday and Sunday, early on in the rounds, when he had a couple of bogeys and you thought, oh no, do not let this be the unraveling. He got himself right back, you know, composed in position and his demeanor never really changed. The only time it did was when he uh, chipped out of the bunker on 18 and he knew that he had you know, he was on the green and he could two putt. He didn't need the two putts, the one putt. And he had a very, very commanding victory. Um, it was just amazing to watch. Well, what got him back, Diana, after you stated he was two over on Saturday and Sunday was exactly what we just spoke of. Driving it in the fairway and then knocking in putts, mid-range putts. We saw so many guys couldn't read the putts. Looked like the only guy on the golf course making putts was Brian Harmon. And, you know, he yeah. talked about after and before and in the middle about how he was disappointed in his sort of career. He hasn't really sort of felt like, you know, he should have won more. But, you know, now that he's won this one, he's got the U.S. Junior Championship when he was a youngster, two Walker Cups. Uh, then he won an NCAA Championship at Georgia, two more tour events, now a major. And I'm betting you that he'll be on the Ryder Cup. So his resume was not far away from being perfect as it were um and now he's 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 into his in the history books we have to talk about his putting because um the big stat was he made 58 of 59 putts within 10 feet you're going to talk about that because you're like well that can be slightly misleading but he did putt lights out and had some fantastic par saves on friday and um well it's friday and saturday but especially on friday um he he just couldn't miss but again he just played his own game and it was so evident for everyone watching that he had confidence he just kept his head down and he just he couldn't miss anything on the greens yeah the 58 out of 58 is very misleading because if you lag up to six inches they count that as inside of 10 feet the real interesting one would be how many putts did he make from five feet to 10 feet 
and mm -hmm. everyone who's watching the show knows, well, it was almost all of them, you know, almost every single one of them uh, that he we saw on TV. And I was texting with Brian over the weekend. I won't give you everything that I was texting him about, but I reminded him what Peter Thompson, who won five British Opens, told me, which was uh, that the reason he did so well in the British Open was he laid back, he put his ball in play, and he didn't make the mistakes that the other players made, and, and he could really chip and putt the ball really well. And Hyman, you know, he acknowledged that via text and knew that because he isn't a long player, although people say, keep saying he's short. He's not really short. He just his, – his natural game worked really well to stay short of those bottlenecks we talked so much about in our show last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he was not the crowd favourite, and that was pretty evident. Tommy Fleetwood, obviously being the local lad, who was in contention, um, really, until nobody was really in the mix on Sunday uh, because Harmon showed no signs of giving any shots back to the field. But Fleetwood was there, um, had a, a devastating end with a triple bogey on 17. And he even said afterwards that he was crushed by the week. You know, obviously amazing to be out there and to have the support of the crowds. Harmon had the opposite and he knew that. I get I don't think he really cared. Um and I think he used it to really spur himself on a bit. I think towards the end, the fans were they were witnessing an amazing victory. And uh, I think everyone really appreciated what Harmon was achieving out there. But they they took a while to warn him. Yeah, I won't even give you the response that I got from him at about 3 a.m. on Sunday night after he won or early Monday morning when I told him when he birdied 14, he broke everybody's heart, including the commentators, because they were looking for a late rally from Rory and others, Ram, and a collapse by Harmon to make this a tight finish on the TV. But we were seeing, you know, if this was Tiger Woods, we would be seeing, we would be in, uh, you know, adjectives of superlatives, Diane, of a clinical destruction of the field at Royal Liverpool. But for Harmon, he just, he just, he works his way. He works his attitude on a chip on his shoulder on purpose. Mm -hmm. And as you yes. noted there, someone in the crowd told him on Saturday when he made two bogeys that he didn't have the stones to win this tournament. And Harmon said, that's exactly what I needed to hear because it snapped me back. And you've heard me say this on this yes. very show about a few times that's happened to me and it, and it slapped me in the face so hard that it put me back into reality. And that was what he needed. Mm -hmm. What is it about Harmon's game that is so impressive to you? What is it about his swing? We filmed a, a Brian Harmon full player channel and we've been posting some of those videos. He has the, the waggle. They had the waggle counter on TV. Um, and they got up to 13 waggles um, at times. But what is it about his swing and his mechanics that's so impressive? Well, it's easy for me here to sit here na now and say, you know, it, you know, what was good about it, but he has a simple swing. I mean, if you flipped it on the screen to right-handed, you would say, wow, that's, that's really rhythmical. It's on balance and it looks good on plane and all the position mm -hmm. looks great. Club phase is in a nice position. And, you know, he, he's not an overpower, but some of those long irons that he hit, I told you, I think on the phone yesterday, I said, I always envisioned myself trying to be in his shoes or any leader's shoes and ask myself, well, could I do what he's doing right now? And of course it looks really narrow on the TV, but, you know, he was able to continue to drive the ball straight in play. That's very difficult to do at that course. We saw yeah. others in front of him. Rory McIlroy talked about the driver being too wet and he couldn't control that. So he went to the three wood and Ram was, you know, in the bunkers and up on the hills and chopping it out of stuff. Uh, they weren't giving up, of course. Fleetwood, you know, ran into that triple bogey, but they never were really in it, Diane, at all. Cameron Young was clearly out of sorts with his putter and he was never in it. Uh, I think Harmon won the, won the tournament on Saturday when he played with yeah. Fleetwood in the last group with all the Liverpool crowd behind him. And, and he, he gained distance on Fleetwood on Saturday. It would have been very disheartening for Fleetwood. And I think Fleetwood has to, I, I agree with some of the commentators, I think he has to have a, a maybe another look at his game or deep inside to see what he's not doing to win some of these big tournaments because he gets himself in position and he's not won any tournaments on the PGA Tour. 
Yeah, which kind of is mind-blowing. Another player that we're going to move on to talk about this week, it was a disastrous week for Justin Thomas, who, after missing the cut, committed to play in the 3M Open this week because, as it stands, playoffs starting in two weeks, he's outside the top 70. Remember, top 70 make it to the playoffs this year, and Justin Thomas could be missing, them as it stands right now, for the first time in, what, seven, eight years? Um, he shot 11 over on Thursday, and... I thought some of his comments were very interesting. I wanted to get your thoughts on this because he said that, you know, some shots that he hits, he feels like he's the best player in the world. And then there's some other shots that he's just completely bamboozled by, um, you know, maybe stupid mistakes that he's making or, you know, what is going on with Justin Thomas out there? Well, what's going on is his putting is terrible. He's 100 and what is he? Can you see it? 160th or something in putting average. He misses, started on the very first hole of the Open Championship. He hit mm -hmm. a very average iron shot short of the bunker and then chipped his ball straight into the bunker right in front of him, right, right in front of his feet. So his confidence is low. He won't be on the Ryder Cup. You can talk about all you want. They're not going to advance Justin Thomas into the Ryder Cup. They've already asked Rory for his opinion and Ram on his opinion. Why would they put an injured... Uh, an injured person into the Ryder Cup and try to sort of hide him or what are they going to do? They can't put him front and center with Spieth. Spieth's not uh, bulletproof either. So Spieth needs a better partner than Justin Thomas. So he's got two more weeks to try to get into the playoffs, but there's no way Justin Thomas is going to be put in the Ryder Cup from outside of the top 12. There's no way. Right, let's have a look at that now. And um, We've actually got the current Ryder Cup US team standings and then we'll talk about the European team as well and um, so you can see that the top six players are the automatic spots on the team and then we have Zach Johnson who's going to be making his captain's picks so Scheffler's in Wyndham Clark Brian Harmon up to number three is just amazing like just so happy for him um, Brooks Kepka, Xander Patrick Cantley, and then Elk, looking at that list, I mean, <laughs> where do you start? Well, you start with the, the number two, three, and four players, Diana. They've all won major championships this year. They've dominated the from the Ryder Cup perspective, the majors as a as a who's carrying the trophies. We have Ram on the other team. Uh, we did have um, uh, Hovland uh, runner up at the at the PGA, but. Diane, there's a good argument right here that you just leave it as the 12 that's there right now. I don't really have, if I was going to imply a sentence that give me an argument for someone that's outside of this top 12 that has to be in. Well, I can do that on the Euro team. We'll get to that in a minute. But there's no argument on any of those players that they have to be in. Sam Burns is 13th. He could change that because he's got weeks in front of him. He was the, mm -hmm. he was the uh, match play champion this year, the Dell match play. So I'll be keeping an eye on him if... Uh, that would be the only one. But I can't make an argument, Diane, that any of those players outside of the 12 absolutely have to be in the team. Okay. I uh, I think looking at it right now, I would be inclined to switch out Cameron Young for Tony Finau, and that would probably be it. Um, but then you have someone like Denny McCarthy, who has had a phenomenal season, came very close to a win at Memorial, and is the best putter on the PGA Tour. Yeah, I'm probably not bringing in guys that haven't won because that's a sort of a expl explanation point on the tour. That's a um, that sort of, uh, you know, solidifies yourself as a winner. Um, everyone else up here, tons of wins. It would be tough on Danny McCarthy to walk into that team with no wins, even though he's a great putter. Then all the pressure would be on his putting. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that, it's just uh, to me, it, it's all talk. And now. There's a bunch of other guys that aren't even on this list, whether it's Bryson Dean, right. above, Dustin Johnson. I mean, there's a ton of other guys that you could throw in the conversation. But right now, top 12 right here is looking really good. Yeah, and um, there's only four more events for the guys to get Ryder Cup points. 3M this week, then we've got the Wyndham, the FedEx, St. Jude, and then the BMW. And the guys get one point for every thousand dollars that they earn in winnings. So there is still the, the chance for volatility, obviously. And as you said, those live guys, like Dustin Johnson, how on earth do you make Patrick an argument? Patrick Reed is another one that would Taylor be, uh, I, mean, I mean, would you uh, take Taylor Patrick Reed over uh, Danny McCarthy? Of course yes. you would. So yeah. um, the U.S. team has so many options. And 
we're going to look at the European Ryder Cup team and it's, they don't have any options. And it's unfortunate <laughs> right now because we see this in the cricket, Diane, the Ashes is being played currently uh, in, mm. in England with Australia and England. And we see different eras of players where we West Australia is loaded with top players. And then we other ones, England is, but I'm looking here, you've got McElroy, Rahm and McIntyre at the top three. It's, uh, but they're going to have to burn some picks, Diane. Unfortunately, Tommy Fleetwood's going to be a pick. Uh, Steve Lowry will be a pick. Victor Hovland will be a pick. And Fleetwood. So they burn four picks just to get their best players to guaranteed onto the team. Now, all these other guys, I know who they are. But you talk about inexperience, Diane. What, are you, what is going on with your team? Well, I'm just having a look right now at some of the guys that are not on our screen right now who are definitely going to make the team, Matthew Fitzpatrick. <laughs> like, there's no way that it's he's a maybe. not going to... Yeah. I mean, to me, that's an absolute given. Um, Sepp Straka, he just had a win at the John Deere, just finished second at the Open. Um, you know, obviously, Shane Lowry, as you said, Tommy Fleetwood's there, Terrell Hatton, um, Justin Rose... Seamus Power, are you taking Justin Rose? Obviously, has a win at Pebble earlier this year and has been playing good. We've seen a, a great turnaround in his game. Um, Seamus Power, too, he's obviously, you know, been talked about a lot, but it's um, really, really uh, tough. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one for the Europeans. It's going to be and a very inexperienced that. team, and, and that's yeah. okay for the future. I know that. Uh, I, I don't think the U.S. has won a tournament in a Ryder Cup in Europe for 30 years or something like that. But this year, it almost guarantees Europe's going to be very thin on the bottom end, Diane. So the, the, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, your captain, Luke Donald, picks the, picks the back end of this team. Mm -hmm. And after we saw what happened at Whistling Straits, you text me immediately and said, you Europeans are going to be in trouble. <laughs> like it is going to be tough and we have the whole live thing as well when we're you know we're losing Ian Poulter we're losing Sergio you know these guys that have been stalwarts of the European team for such a long time um, and it's you know it's as even sad a shame it it's even a shame that the, those guys aren't even going to be allowed to be involved I mean you see right. a lot of guys sometimes like Stenson and Poulter and Sergio and I see some Spanish guys and some other nationalities on the bottom of that board. It would really, it would really help those guys if they had all those other guys hanging around. It's a maybe an oversight. We don't know what's going to happen in the golf landscape in the next month or so, where or the next two or three months. But are we all overreacting? And should all these guys be allowed to be all back together? Yeah, it's um, as as we were saying. There's still four tournaments for points to be handed out, and then we have the Ryder Cup in September. So it's really not far away. Okay, yeah, and right. Well, also, let's move I think Luke Donald has a decision to make. Diane, you know, when you look at Hovland, he's not even on the team. He won at Muirfield. He's he was up in the top five in all four majors, basically. British, I think he finished tenth. How does he not qualify on points? Do they not have points for the Americans? Uh, on the American tour and, and a lot of these guys on your list, could you put your list up there one more time? A lot of these top players, they all play in the U S so how is mm -hmm. it? How does a European uh, contingent Diane, they got to get behind some of these guys that they've been watching all season. Terrell Hatton, uh, Lowry, Hovland, Fleetwood, they all play on the U S tour. So um, yeah. it's almost U S versus U S here. Well, when you have a look, um, they have the European points and then they have the world points as well. And the world points for the Euros, it's Ram, McElroy, Hovland, Hatton, Fleetwood, Fitzpatrick, Straka, Lowry, Rose, McIntyre, Moronk, and then Power. So, yeah, I'm going to be intrigued, especially because there's only three that have their automatic place and then nine captain's picks. So Luke Donald has got a job on his hands. Okay, yes. well... Let's talk about the 3M Open because we're off to Blaine, Minnesota this week, TBC Twin Cities. Now, remember last year, this was that Tony Finau victory. And uh, this is when he got the kind of um, the monkey off his back because we'd been waiting for a Finau win for such a long time. And he went, hey, but watch this and went back to back winning the Rocket Mortgage. The schedule was a bit different last year, but he won the Rocket Mortgage the following week. Um, 
Maybe it's going to spark something for Justin Thomas. You never know. Because JT, as I said, he did commit after missing the cut at the Open last week because he needs those FedEx Cup points. Now, remember, we have this week and then next week for the Wyndham and then the playoffs begin and it's the top 70. So there's a lot of guys playing this week who are there or thereabouts and need those points to lock their places in. Um, some of the, the other big names... Cameron Young is going to be playing, taking that long haul flight from the Open. Sepp Straka, Emiliano Grillo, who had a fantastic week at Royal Liverpool. Um, so we have some big names playing. The big hitters are traditionally the ones that have done well around here. Traditionally speaking on this course, very flat. I've played the course many times, Diane. Um, Nine holes comes into water comes into play on this course. Kind of a tricky little course on the back nine. You've got little shots across water and so on. 15, 17, somewhere in there has been winning this tournament. But it's only ever been done two ways. One way, basically, last year, Finau hit the ball. He basically led off the tee. He basically led approach shots and he chipped well. And he putted average and he won. But every other year, Diane, it's always about putting. Putting and approach shots to this because you position yourself into the fairway on these course on this course. And then, as I said, there's nine shots across water. So obviously, if you're in the rough, that's not going to work. So uh, the last all the other years, first, second and thirds over the last two or three years, Diane, it's all been about putting and approach okay. shots. So my team, you know, I'm thinking about two things here. One is who's really motivated to get into the top 70. That's one yes. question. And who's who's still trying to get points for the Ryder Cup? Ah, OK, that's a decent question. And then who's trying to secure their car, top 125? Well, they've got some time for that, but we are into the sort of the fatigue part of the uh, conversation mm -hmm. here. A lot of the top players are, are laying off right now. And, and honestly, the younger and the guys that are down the list, they like it when the, all the stars are laying off at home because there's a ton of money left on the table for them to win. So yes. uh, that being said, my teams are this week, Diane, are all stacked with two categories, putting and approach shots. Okay, well, when Cameron Champ won here in 2021, he was 10th in distance for the week. We know how huge a hitter he is. 92nd in accuracy, so that paints a picture. Um, Fino, as you say, amazing off the tee stats last year. He was long and he was accurate. He had 12% more fairways than the field average. Um, so remember the big Bryson DeChambeau and Matt Wolf. A battle in what 2019 when Matt Wolf made a super long eagle putt on the 18th hole and um, to go on and win. So God, it's kind of sad talking about Bryson and Matt Wolf because those were great days. That was a a phenomenal end to the tournament, and Matt Wolf was the new kid on the block on the PGA Tour and and just stamped his mark with authority. Yeah, in the last two holes on this course, 17 is a medium range par three about a seven iron or a six iron all the way across water and then 18 you drive up onto a flat just short of a giant water hazard that goes all the way to the green and the, and the fairway wraps around to the left almost every player can go for the green in two so as you say matt wolf eagled it to beat bryson that year always a lot of drama it's worth a look this weekend to see what's happening but <clears throat> again the the whole approach to this week diane if you're looking at long shots you better have someone that can putt because long shots do not hit the ball better than the, the top players. They have to putt their way into the lead. Brian mm -hmm. Harmon, of course, is a all-star player, but he out-putted everyone last week like crazy. And that was what lifted him up to the claret jug. I have such a good dark horse for you this week, and I'm purposely not telling you it until we do the big reveal. <laughs> so we each have three picks. We will do an outright favorite, one to watch, and a dark horse. Okay, who's going first with the outright favorite? I'll go. Okay. I'll, I'll go. My my player this week missed the cut last week at uh, the Open, so I feel like he's uh, well-rested. He's come back over to America. This kid I watched all season. He's going to win on the tour. I ran into him in our locker room recently. He just joined our club, talking about Sahith Fagala. And he, his stats are great. I mean, he has the two stats. Of the, the two things that I like about uh, him this week, Diane, number eight in putting, uh, number 41 in greens and reg. Hits the ball a ton with a big high fade. There's plenty of room on this course for him to move that around. 32nd on the FedEx. He's going to be in the, he's going to be in the playoffs, and that's going to be a nice run for him. So. 
I'm looking for some energy out of him this week. He would have been very disappointed with his performance over there at the Open. So, um, again, I'm stacking my teams with great putters this week because you're not going to get to 17 under at this tournament without being able to putt. We saw Cameron Young, and I bet you that he's not on your board. He would be, should be on our board, but he's not putting well. Let's see where he is. Oh, he's like 100, 200, 119th in ranked putting. Yeah. So there you go. Cameron Young's the favourite this week at 14 to 1, actually. And, uh, he's not so my favourite. No, you've got him at 35 to 1. I just found the gala at 50 to 1. It's gone up. So I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, if we're talking about power off the tee as well, we've all seen the gala's swing. Um, and he can really make birdies. You're going to have to go low this week to win. And the gala's going to have to hit it better. close and putt well. Yeah. Okay. So you have the gala as your favorite. I am taking someone that we just mentioned. He is making that long haul flight from Liverpool to Blaine, Minnesota. I am taking Emiliano Grillo. Now he is coming off a T6 finish at the Open. And last year at the 3M, he finished runner up to Finau. Not only that, but he has an additional two top 10 finishes here. Um, his season has been a little bit streaky on paper, but he got that win at the end of May at Colonial. He has an additional four top seven finishes and is sitting at number 23 in the FedEx Cup standing. So yes, streaky season with some missed cuts and some high finishes, but my goodness, <laughs> what a great position to be in um, when the playoffs are just around the corner. You know, looking at his stats, his off the tee and his approach um, are definitely his strengths. He's eighth in total birdies for the season as well. So I think runner up, great finish at the Open last year. He's also had two other top tens, loves this course, has all the confidence from a win and a great position to be sitting in for the FedEx Cup playoffs. So Emiliano Grillo at well, 25 to 1. I found him at 30 to 1 at the start of the week, but I think he's fallen to 25 to 1. I like him too. And he's full of confidence. Played with Roy McElroy on Sunday. And if you weren't looking at Emilio uh, like I was playing with Rory, he played tons better than Rory. He was in all the fairways, hitting those longer shots into the green, solid. Uh, I think they're both tied for like six or something. So he'd be full of confidence playing with Rory McElroy in the rain, hitting all these great long iron shots. So, yeah. I had him on my board, and then you text me, broke my heart that I wasn't going to be able to pick him, but that's okay. I'll stay with the guy. <laughs> we had to prove who had text our producer quicker with the timestamp yeah, exactly. <laughs> to claim him. Um, the other thing I love, and we talked about this at the time, after he won at Colonial, he won in a playoff. And remember, as he was getting ready for the playoff, he, there were some kids hanging around, and he got them on the first tee because they were about to refurbish the course, and he had them hitting balls and just completely got himself in a great place and took his mind off the impending uh, playoff and what was at stake. And it was just so smart. Yeah, indeed. And uh, yeah, I, I think he's going to be one of these emerging players. You know, he's, he's slightly ahead of, uh, we were talking about uh, on the Ryder Cup, was it Denny McCarthy? Yeah. <laughs> he's slightly yeah. ahead, realistically, just won at Colonial. So we're going to see this next wave of players, the gala, uh, could you give me the name of uh, uh, who won last week at uh, Barracuda again? Because I get that wrong every time. Akshay Batia. Yeah. Another another, <laughs> another new guy on the block. Uh, so now he's yeah. won Corn Ferry, now won Tour. Here we go. New guys. Yeah. And uh, Ludwig Aberg as well, who uh, graduated from the PGA Tour University as a number one college guy. And he's playing this week. He's 30 to 1. Um, okay, so you're taking Sahitha Gala and I have got Emiliano Grillo up top. Right, our ones to watch, so guys at slightly higher odds, um, I will kick off with mine. So we know that it's going to take a good driving week this week as well. You know, putting is obviously going to be important, but looking at the Tony Finau model from last year, he was uh, great in distance, great in accuracy. And my guy, Keith Mitchell, currently leads the tour in total driving. Now, the thing about Mitchell is he is in a bit of a crazy position. 
So he went over and played the Scottish Open. And he was pretty sure that he was going to be in the field for the Open. I mean, he's 64th in the world rankings. And he didn't get in. He was fifth alternate. So he decided, okay, hang on a minute. Sitting at 66 in the FedEx Cup standings, I need some points to secure my place in the top 70. He played the Barracuda and missed the cut. So, you know, coming off a missed cut in Scotland, a missed cut at the Barracuda, he's only sitting at number 66 for the top 70. Um, this is a, this is down to the wire for Keith Mitchell, who we all know is just, you know, an amazing player. He's, um, you know, look at that stat there. Second in strokes gained off the tees, 10th in distance. Um, he finished fifth here in 2021. So I think, you know, 40 to one, I found him at 50 to one early this morning as well for Keith Mitchell. He's under a bit of pressure from himself and also from people looking in who are very aware of the situation that he's in. So it's um, it's all on the line for Mitchell over the next two weeks to make sure that nobody uh, or not too many people leapfrog him and, and take his place in the playoffs. And he probably could have saved himself a bunch of energy and <clears throat> flew home after the Scottish took a week off mm -hmm. because he's going to have to play these next two weeks. So he's gone play Scottish, back to Barracuda, yeah. now back to Minnesota. That's a lot of travel. So he's wearing himself out. We'll see what happens there. He's on. He's mm -hmm. a little bit like Justin Thomas. He's not quite in that depth, but he's sort of off the boil, so to speak, as you know what I mean. Um, I'm taking, for my player to watch, this guy always plays, I text with him all the time too. He always plays good in June, July, August. You know, he started out at, um, what's the tournament down in Alabama that he got beaten a playoff uh, by Seamus Power? I'm talking about JT. Yeah, the Barbasol, the one in Kentucky that they decided. Yeah, and then the next year he won John Deere. This year he played well at John Deere. Uh, he also played pretty well at the Scottish. He played well at the Open, and he plays well here. And his best stat, if you ever know anyone knows anything about JT Poston's game, his best stat by a mile is putting, and his other mm -hmm. best stat is is hitting the ball to the green. So. Uh, this is kind of his time of year. I don't know why, but I'm a big on this. You know it is, biorhythm, whatever you want to call it. Mine was about <laughs> March, April, somewhere in there. Played really well. Won a bunch of tournaments in that type, that side of the year. Maybe it was because before the flowers bloomed and they got hammered with the allergies. But whatever, I'm taking J po JT Poston this week uh, to play well at Minnesota, Diane. Okay, and he's sitting at 60 in the FedEx Cup standing. Yeah. So again, he's got to he secure his spot there. 27th in putty, 53rd in approach. So I'm happy with where he is there. Those two, those are his yeah. two best stats. And he won the Wyndham in 2019, and it's the Wyndham next week. So yeah, as you say, just a great time of year. When he won the Wyndham, he went bogey free, and he's been playing really, really well. Top 10 at the Scottish, as you said, and a good finish at the Open last week. So. JT Poston, always a big fan. Um, I am, oh no, I gave you mine. I'm Keith Mitchell. So I'm just too excited about my dark horse because I keep looking at that. <laughs> well, I you're so excited. I'm going to let you do it last. Oh, okay. Okay. No, do you, do you um, want to go ahead? I'm gonna, no, you go ahead. No, you, okay. no, because my guy is 350 to one. So I know okay. that you're not. That. <laughs> I think mine is about 125. And I talked at the top of the show about motivation. Uh, what's happening here? Who's try? Who's trying the hardest? Who's the most? Who has the most energy? We are getting into the dark, the summer days of the tour, where you know there's guys out there that are just exhausted. JT, JT, Keith Mitchell's got to be exhausted trying to chase some of this stuff. I'm talking about Nate Lashley, and again, I'm looking at two stats for him: 39th in putting, played pretty solid this year. He's 88th on the FedEx. What would a top 10 for him do this week? It would be a lot. So uh, he's looking to get into the playoffs very quickly. He's got two weeks to do it. And 88th is not far out. So I'm looking at I'm looking at guys that, that putt well, long shots. As I said earlier, the only way a long shot can climb the board, Diane, is superior putting. And that's his, that's his best stat. Yeah, it's right. As you say, it's, uh, it's burnout time for a lot of these guys, especially, you know, guys that didn't make it into the Open, would have played the two alternate field events, you know, if not both of them, one of them, um, the Barracuda and the Barbasol the week before, and then now they have this week and the Wyndham foot down and they, they have to 
They have to make some moves. Nate Lashley is definitely one of those guys. Okay, my dark horse this week is 350 to 1. Um, not only that, I had a look, we always say that when it comes to the dark horse, you know, look at these guys for like a top 10, a top 20. Um, Bryce Garnett is nine to one to finish within the top 20 as well. Now, he has played here four times before and has always finished well. His best finish has been 16th uh, two years ago. His worst was 31st. He also has a 26th and a 23rd place. But Elk, this is the bit you're gonna love. When you look at his stats, his best stat is putting. <laughs> he is 28th on the PGA Tour right now um, in putting. Sorry, well, not on the tour, but we're talking about in the, the guys that are in the field this week. He's sitting at 28th. So how good is that? At 350 to one, a guy that plays well here and, you know, obviously puts really well. What is he on the FedEx currently? He's not in a great position. But remember, with the FedEx, we talk about the top 70 making it to the playoffs. The rest of the guys have until the end of the calendar year, the RSM Classic in November, to get into the 125 to secure their full playing privileges for the following year. He's 159th in the FedEx right now. Yeah. So 125 is his goal, and he knows he's got until November to do so. And he has to see this week as being a great opportunity to get some very valuable points. Bearing in mind, he's played well here before. Um, and he just needs to maintain a hot putter and keep it in control off the tee. But Bryce Garnett at 350 to 1. And as I said, for a top 29 to 1. I love that. Well, there's, there's certainly there's guys that play well at certain venues. As you know, we saw all those top players last week not being able to read the, read those greens. Tommy Fleetwood, of course, was the biggest one. He was he was a big disappointment in reading Diane, wasn't able to get it online. But when you talk about a player that goes to a tournament that's a good putter, does he know the breaks? You betcha. They remember him. And we we remember we remember where we've been on almost every course, Diane, when it comes when it comes to these pin placements. We have a in, instinctive uh attitude about we know how much that putt sort of breaks. You know, we don't need a, a green book. We don't need all that. I mean Tiger Woods didn't use any of that. Uh, he was a great reader of the green. So, yes, the only way a long shot, Diane, can catch up to these top players is putting. So, yeah. well dug out of the Thanks. pile. My other guy, and I'm just going to give you his name because I know you like him, is James Han. Um, he's 200 to 1, and he finished fourth year last year, played well, and finished sixth at the Barracuda um, last week. So, yeah, I like that he was my the other guy but it came down to the putting and Bryce Garnett's putting stats were better than James Hans. I was looking at Sam Ryder number two on the on this tournament in putting and number 25 in greens hit he could do something this week too so uh yeah. and he has his no new commercial with Ryder so that's cool uh <laughs> and look at, having a lot of fun with that look at his FedEx cup number he's sitting at number 69 so exactly like, as we would say in Scotland his coat is on a sugarly peg Exactly. <laughs> whatever that whatever whatever that means, I agree with your coach. That coach. <laughs> okay then. So looking at our picks for this week, my outright favorite is Emiliano Grillo. You're taking Sahita Gala. Our ones to watch. I have Keith Mitchell, and you are going with JT Poston. JT Poston, and then for our dark horses, Nate Lashley. And I have got Bryce Garnett. We're throwing in Sam Ryder and we're throwing in James Han as well. All right. So big week, as we said, 3M Open this week. Two regular events before those FedEx Cup playoffs begin. We've got the Wyndham in Greensboro, which is a huge event. And we know that you have some great personal memories of playing in Greensboro, Elk. Oh, yes, indeed. And of course, we're watching, you know, what we're focused on this week, Diane, is Guys that are trying to get into the FedEx Cup, watching Ryder Cup potentials like, uh, you know, JT, uh, Justin Thomas trying to, what is he, what can he do? Will, will, you know, will these other top players take another week off next week or are they secure? I mean, we're, we're looking at sort of the awards part of the show now, uh, the mm -hmm. awards of the tour, getting into the playoffs, et cetera. 
Yep. And of course, the Ryder Cup. We're definitely keeping an eye on those points and those standings and the guys that are going to be making a real impression on Zach Johnson and McDonald. Right. Thank you, Elk. Thank you very much for watching and for listening to the Tour Report. And we'll be back next week for the Wyndham Championship.